Top story at this hour, the Pakistan ISI Khalistani terror nexus is trying to stoke hijab fire in India. India today has accessed the exclusive intel note warning local police forces and law enforcement agencies of a hijab referendum being pushed by ISI through terror groups seek for justice. Intel note issued on the 11th of February says SFJ had called upon Muslims in India to start hijab referendum <coughs> to carve out Urduistan in areas of Rajasthan, Delhi, UP, Bihar and West Bengal where Muslim dominated areas will be free to practice their religious beliefs. Global terrorist Guru Patwan Singh Pannu while addressing Muslims of India says today ban is on hijab, tomorrow it's going to be on azan, namaz and then Quran. Now it is the time to balk balkanize Union of India and create Urduistan. He's also said that Muslims should learn from Pakistan. SFJ Council has further assured Muslims of India that the group is going to organize and fund a referendum movement to break Union of India to create Urduistan. Meanwhile, a big twist has surfaced in the Karnataka hijab protest. Karnataka Home Minister has accused the Campus Front of India, also known as CFI, of instigating the pro-hijab protest. CFI is the student wing of the Popular Front of India. CFI allegedly asked parents to take on college and the parents were accompanied by lawyers of CFI. Meanwhile, UDP MLA Raghupati Bhatt has requested the Karnataka government to investigate the link of the CFI with the protest and then matter refer this matter to the NIA. What really is the genesis of the hijab showdown that has gone national? Who is behind this flare up? India today has pieced together a timeline that suggests that anti-rape protests held by the ABVP in the month of October last year could have actually been the trigger to all of this. What triggered this hijab versus saffron shawl showdown in Karnataka? What fueled protests that have gone national? There was protest in Udupi led by ABVP on 30th October last year, demanding a probe into the alleged rape of a Manipal student. <laughs> Images showed Muslim girls holding the ABVP flag as part of the protest. Reports suggest that one of the students, Muskan Zainab from the PU College, who's now a petitioner in the case, took part in the protest. And that allegedly infuriated the PFI-linked student body, Campus Front of India. In that, they are in the front with burqa, not only hijab, with burqa they are there. That, for that was an issue for campus front of Indare. Muslim girls are going to, for a ABVP protest. The matter quickly led to a standoff between the families of six Muslim students and the college management. The college principal told India Today that Zainab didn't attend the protest at the behest of the institution. Sir, other Nantal no CFI or Bandu Nimatra, Matra, the ugly students with the interact. Nanatra Matra Likna, Athalde Borwagle, aggressive Agi, Bonita. Okay, some of the Akin Miri, Piho Madi, the Ramono together. Students remain defiant. CFI, the campus affiliate of the PFI, an Islamist outfit that was set up in Kerala in 2006, was now backing them. BJP has been wanting to ban PFI because of its allegedly radical tendency. We have not banned hijab. We have only asked to remove the hijab in the classroom. In the veranda, till the classroom it is allowed. When the class starts, we asked to remove it. Like earlier, it is not from um, the earlier. So one conspiracy is that. The police say there is nothing to confirm that the October 2021 stir triggered the hijab face-off. I can't confirm that at present, but Nandu Vakila Maiti, we are also trying to verify. Nandu okay. Udupi uh, police have given some intel report. Is it true, sir? 
Curiously unverified Twitter handles of four out of six pro hijab petitioners from PU College Udupi came up between October and November 2021. These handles have been regularly posting updates on the hijab controversy and have also retweeted content from Campus Front of India. Completely nonsense. ऐसे कुछ छोटे मोटे बात को लेके कंप्लीट लाइक इशू को इधर गुमराने के लिए कि कोशिश कर रहे हैं तो इशू टोटली क्या है बोले तो कॉन्स्प्रेसिस का बिहेंड क्या है बोले तो ये इशू को लेके बीजेपी गवर्नमेंट फायदा उठाने को चाह रही है ये इसका पीछे का एक एक साजिश है हिजाब विवादा हिजाब राव दैट हैज नाउ स्नोबॉल्ड इन कर्नाटका सीम्स टू बी रूटेड इन द कम्युनली फ्रॉट कोस्टल बेल्ट वेयर रेडिकल ऑर्गेनाइजेशंस आर फाइटिंग फॉर सुप्रीमसी विद नागार्जुन द्वारकानाथ ब्यूरो रिपोर्ट इंडिया टुडे Hijab face-off continues to simmer. Protests were held from Chennai to Vishakapatnam to Aligarh. The Supreme Court yesterday declined an urgent hearing, saying that there is no need to make the issue a national one. The left versus right war has now become 100% political. The six Udupi students who triggered Karnataka's hijab war. A day after they received their first setback from the state's high court, they received their second setback today from the country's Supreme Court. Their demand to be allowed to wear hijabs to class declined by a three-judge bench in Bengaluru on Thursday. On Friday, the Supreme Court refused an urgent hearing, saying it will hear the issue at an appropriate time. Petitioners before the apex court argued that this is effectively suspending their fundamental rights. The apex court has said that this is not an appropriate time for the Supreme Court to step in and let the Karnataka High Court deal with the matter at the moment. Continuing with its agenda-setting coverage of the story grabbing national attention, India Today's reporters also spotted protests breaking out in several parts of the country. From Chennai... Protests in favor of wearing hijab is occurring at Chennai currently. This is Aminurusa Mosque in Chennai, a prominent spot where you could see protesters have gathered. They are holding placards in their hand saying that hijab is their identity and it is not acceptable to overstep on it. To Uttar Pradesh's Aligarh, from Vishakapatnam, to Malegaon. As the protests spread and intensified, Netas faced off on an issue that is no longer confined to Karnataka. पाकिस्तान की इंट्री हो गई आज इसीलिए देश में जरूरत है एक देश एक कानून कॉमन सिविल कोड होनी चाहिए ये देश एक है कानून भी अब एक होनी चाहिए इस तरीके से इश्यू बना के डिफरेंसेस क्रिएट मत करिए हमारे बहनों को पढ़ने दीजिए आगे बढ़ने दीजिए चाहे मुसलमान रहें दो चाहे हिंदू रहें दो आप डिफरेंसेस पैदा मत करिए ये पॉलिटिकल एजेंडे की खातिर ये जो ना डिफरेंसेस पैदा करके ये लोगों को दबाया जा रहा है Meanwhile, the six petitioners continue to be cloistered by the Islamist group, the Campus Front of India, a group directly accused by the Karnataka government of instigating the protests. <laughs> Meanwhile, with schools all set to open, classes 1 to 10 from Monday in Karnataka, all eyes will be on safety and court compliance. <laughs> यी वंदो हिजाब ये इन उन्नतो नम्मा समस्ते वाला गड़ा दना दायित्व आविद्यार्थी निरो अवर इंदे यार इधर अवरो दायित्व निल सिद्रे। Will things return to normal or will the ugly scenes Udupi witnessed this week return to haunt coastal Karnataka? With Nabila Jamal in Udupi and Anisha Mathur in Delhi, Bureau Report India Today. Meanwhile, politics continues to drive the raging hijab war, leading to a flurry of protests from Jammu to Chennai. Amid high tension, students continue to suffer and await clarity from the government. Meanwhile, colleges in Karnataka will remain shut till the 16th of February. Take a look at this report. Protests. Politics. Courtroom drama and murky twists. The hijab showdown continues to gain traction across India. 
Tense calm prevails across Karnataka. But from Jammu to Chennai, protests have gone viral. In Delhi, SFI activists, including JNU Student Union President Aishi Ghosh, have been detained for planning a protest. Amid the snowballing tensions, security has beefed up at the epicenter of protests, UDP. Paramilitary forces conducted a flag march in the district. Amid the protests, students are the ones who continue to suffer. The Education Department has extended closure of all degree colleges, universities and professional courses till February 16th, from earlier February 11th. There is no clarity yet on classes 11th and 12th. Karnataka CM along with district collectors and SPs on Friday to discuss precautionary measures for reopening of schools. Officials will visit prominent schools in sensitive areas. District collectors and SPs will stay in touch with schools. Immediate action will be taken against miscreants. The administration will hold peace meets and follow high course directions. There will be a crackdown on rumour mongers. Politics continues over hijab controversy. The BJP has slammed the Congress, saying there was no such issue of hijab for 70 years, blaming the grand old party for the row. जो लोग तुष्टीकरण की राजनीति करते हैं, हर चुनाव में नए-नए प्रयोग करते हैं, केवल जाति और धर्म के नाम पर वांट कर बोट बटोरने का काम करते हैं, वो केवल यही करते रहे हैं 77 सालों में। इस बार फिर कांग्रेस ने वो शुरू किया है, और मैं कहना चाहता हूँ 2014 से 2022 तक आपने एक के बाद दूसरा प्रयोग किया जनता आपके झांसे में नहीं आई है असम सीएम ऑन द अदर हैंड सेड द कांग्रेस इज ट्राइंग टू डिवाइड द कंट्री ये कांग्रेस हर चुनाव का पहले जो मोदी जी सेस्ता करता है प्रयास करता है कि चुनाव विकास का इशू में सले डेवलपमेंट पॉलिटिक्स देश में शुरू हो लेकिन कांग्रेस बार-बार तुष्टीकरण तक ले गया after Congress, the TMC has raised voice against the hijab ban. Every citizen of this country has a right to practice his own religion, his or her own religion, in the manner they are practicing for decades together. All on a sudden, some fatwa will come from a government that you stop this doing. Uh, this is a direct interference on the religious practice of the citizens to which we are opposed. Meanwhile, the Supreme Court has refused to take up a plea by students against the ban on hijab. The Apex Court has advised students to wait for the High Court order. Bureau Report, India Today. Meanwhile, United States in its Indo-Pacific strategic report has said that India faces very significant geopolitical challenges from China. The report points... U.S. vision to firmly anchor the United States' position in the Indo-Pacific, strengthen the region and support India's rise and regional leadership in the process. The report has also added that China is combining its economic, diplomatic, military and technological might as it pursues a sphere of influence in the Indo-Pacific and seeks to become the world's most influential power. The Indo-Pacific strategic report was released as part of the Quad Ministerial with foreign ministers of Australia, India, Japan and the US, which is underway in Australia. The ministers expressed concerns over the role China is playing in the region. US Secretary of State Antony Blinken has met Indian counterpart S. Jai Shankar on the sidelines of the Quad Ministerial in Melbourne. It's an uh, issue in which a lot of countries legitimately take interest, particularly if they are from the Indo-Pacific region because uh, uh, the situation has arisen due to the disregard by China in 2020 of written agreements with us not to mass forces at the border. So when a large country disregards written commitments, I think it's an issue for, of legitimate concern for the entire international community. My colleague Gaurav Savant is getting us more details on that story. Gaurav, over to you. 
extremely significant report and let's split this in two. There are two very important aspects. One, the United States sees India as a regional security provider, as a country that plays an extremely significant role uh, and an extremely significant leadership role in this region, uh, in, in the Indo-Pacific. So that, uh, that means that the US, uh, you'd remember it, it's happening for some time when we will, we will be seeing this as India being the pivot to Asia. Remember, it was said in the time of Barack Obama, but all the way now, uh, you see India as a very strong regional security provider. That's point one. Point two, yes, there is a huge challenge that India faces. As External Affairs Minister Dr. S. Jay Shankar pointed out, that China has violated a number of written agreements between the two countries and amassed over 50,000 soldiers along the Sino-Indian line of actual control in Ladakh in 2020. But look at how India is responding. And this is where Sneha it becomes extremely significant because the entire world is watching not just India counterbalance China, but also carry out a quid pro quo operation, which puts China on the back foot, compelling China now to build bridges as a defensive mechanism. The two armies remain in a standoff position. There have been multiple rounds of talks at the level of co-commander commanders there has been engagement at uh, disengagement at several points yet the problem remains but look at how india is in a way inspiring the world to stand up to an expansionist power in the region absolutely uh, Gaurav V with us, I'll just go across also to my, uh, my colleague, our foreign affairs editor, uh, Geeta Mohan, who has more details on that story. Uh, the particular role of China being spoken about uh, in the context also of the rising tensions, uh, especially in the post-pandemic world, really, uh, between the, the US and the China as well. Geeta, in this entire report. Well, that's right. Mm -hmm. The fact that uh, the uh, the squad had come together, these countries, not just because there are convergences in the ways, the values, the thought process, and in how these democracies want to move forward in, in the Indo-Pacific region and across the globe uh, uh, in, in a larger perspective, it's also about the countries coming together to face challenges together. And therefore, the significant statement coming in from the United States of America when it put out the Indo-Pacific strategy is also the off-record briefing by a White House official where he very clearly said that India has challenges and the, uh, the, the situation in the, uh, in the line of actual control, at the line of actual control, really galvanizes the impact uh, that India faces and, uh, uh, and certainly uh, reiterated the United States position of standing by and with India in uh, in ensuring that uh, uh, that uh, countering of the Chinese aggression is done together as uh, as a bloc, and that's not just with the United States of America. Look at the significant statements that have come in the bilateral talks that took place between India and Australia as well. The same thing: Chinese aggression and challenges are uh, everybody for every uh, quad member to handle, not just one country alone. What is the reaction of China today that this Gita, is all what is attempt? extremely significant, if I may, absolutely, Gita, if I may, and, uh, you know, Sneha, uh, Gita, it's not just the quad conversation, but also very significant bilateral conversations absolutely. that India has had, not just with Australia, but also with the United States of America on tackling an expansionist China. But break this down for us in terms of nuts and bolts. How does... How do, how do democracies come together to deal with an expansionist China? Well, there are a few very important aspects. Now, everybody focuses on military, Gaurav, but the fact is that it's not just military. Uh, we've seen the military alliance when it comes to office. India continues to maintain that Quad is primarily taking on all other aspects as well. And what hurts uh, any country the most today? It's when your economy is hit. So while we're talking about military alliances, bilaterally very strong military alliances with all these three countries, India is looking at strengthening and becoming a key, uh, playing a key role in the Indo-Pacific when it comes to the supply chain as well. Supply chain resilience is, uh, is, is very important and key and is one of the important, uh, part, is, a, is an important part of the Indo-Pacific strategy that has been spelled out. Connectivity how connected these countries can be to keep a country like China out. If you see, uh, Taiwan has been mentioned uh, quite quite uh, strongly in the Indo-Pacific strategy because 
if uh, if the quad can contain Chinese aggression in Taiwan, then half the battle, more than half yes. the battle, is won. South Korea's interests very important for America, but also oh, important absolutely. to ensure there is uh, security and uh, and freedom of navigation in the entire water uh, across the Taiwan Strait, uh, Taiwan Strait, and the South China Sea. We're talking about prosperity. When we talk about prosperity no, when we talk and about economic Taiwan, growth, Oh, absolutely. And, you know, when we talk about Taiwan, it becomes very significant because this is where it indicates, Sneha, that democracies are coming together to checkmate China and empower Taiwan and with Taiwan. And that is where, you know, whether it's the semiconductors or technology from Taiwan, alternate supply chains from Taiwan, all of that will, will in a way, really perhaps in times to come put China in its place mm -hmm. and perhaps force China to rethink its 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 aggressive policy, whether it's along the India-China line of actual control or Taiwan or elsewhere. All right, but China is uh, crying foul, saying this is an attempt uh, to undermine, uh, you know, international solidarity in that sense and also ensure U.S. dominance continues. And uh, Australia and the others are complicit, is what China has said, as a reaction to the developments from the Quad Ministerial Summit. Thank you, Geeta, as well as uh, Gaurav, for joining us with your perspective on that important story that we are tracking very closely.